Chapter 9. Rebellion. Commotion at the docks broke Gregor's concentration. The elegant script with long serifs slipped out of focus, and his eyes drifted towards the window. He had resolved to remain seated, to turn back to his folios, when a man's panicked scream, followed by what sounded like war cries, confirmed to him that something was truly amiss. The windowsill was cold to the touch, and so was the sea breeze in his face, but neither registered long in his consciousness once he saw the battle unfolding quayside. Disheveled, bedraggled men surged up and out of the hold of the ship at port. Slaves, Gregor reckoned, the newest shipment that they had procured to work on the castle Dralstrom's crumbling seawall, but somehow they had freed themselves, and neither the crew nor Gregor's own servants were able to stop them. A rebellion on the quay, a gravelly voice said from behind him. Gregor hid his displeasure at Felix's unannounced arrival. Gregor was the titular ruler of Dralstrom, and by extension, all of the servwar, but Felix still felt free to sneak up on him, and, Gregor suspected, check up on him regularly. Gregor didn't like it, but, as always, he was careful how he played out his hand. After all, his role called for a maturity beyond his years. The guards look reluctant to interfere, Gregor said, noticing how the servor fighters, men selected for their cruelty and brawn to be the muscle of the order, remained on the battlements. I imagine they await orders before they abandon their posts and join the fray. Reluctant they would be to harm slaves, as they would likely take their places on the seawall if we run short of workers. We can send some of our students, then, to quell the fight. It might be good practice, Gregor said trying to sound bold, decisive, and hiding the speculative nature of his statement. We could, sir. Do you think they are up to it? Not if you just questioned it. Gregor was growing impatient. His attention locked onto one slave in particular, a young man, pale and emaciated, who had fallen down on the deck, shaking in a sort of fit. Another older slave bent over to try to attend to him, while the others continued their revolt. The chaos was growing and ran the risk of spreading. Gregor saw two guards struggling to close the doors on the gate between the bailey and the docks, while slaves, swinging their chains as weapons, approached. All order might be lost if the slaves infiltrated the castle. Gregor reached out with his power, extending his consciousness around the doors the way vines might creep along their lengths and edges. Once he held them firmly in his mind's grasp, he slammed them shut and locked them with a final flourish of his hand. The guards who had been leaning against the doors lost their footing and fell into the mud. Gregor had half a mind to go down and spell the slaves into submission himself, even if the cruelty of it unnerved him. Well done, my lord. Will you go down to stop the rebellion yourself? Again, Felix showed an uncanny ability to guess his innermost thoughts. If for no other reason than to be contrary, Gregor turned on his heel and walked away at a swift clip. No, I will call upon the Revenant. A phantom of that statue should keep them in line for years to come. A wise choice, my lord, Felix said. Damn you, Felix. Damn you. The Revenant waited in repose in a chamber that only Gregor was allowed to enter. It was in the far northwest tower of the castle, the entire wing of which was off limits to all but he. However, he suspected some of the lower ranking servors, Felix's spies, snooped through some of the hidden passageways. Yet none of them knew the castle's secrets like he. None of them had grown up in the place and none of them had the freedom to explore castle and grounds as he had. It was difficult to tell where the rocks and cliffs ended and the fortress began, its own steep walls, imposing battlements, cut from the same gray-black stone of the isle. Dralstrom offered a sinister face to the world on an unforgiving crag, the shoals of which had been the graveyard for many a ship. Dig in the shingle of the shore, and one would find bones, it was said. 
With the commotion at the quayside and lessons in session for the students, Gregor was confident he was alone, so he broke into a less than dignified run down the corridor to his private study. He entered through a heavy iron door that opened not with a key but with spells that he snapped out with a flash of his flattened palm. Then he climbed a stairwell that wound up into the highest chamber of the tower. The shutters were fastened closed, and the room was lost in gloom except for the merest cracks of light outlining the windows. This high up, it was impossible to keep out the wind that churned over the sea and piled storm clouds into the great thunderhead that poured down daily on the isle. But the revenant did not need light nor warmth, and it required only the barest sustenance, as it was a body, in this case one of the champion soldiers who had volunteered for the honor, but mostly dead now. The consciousness of that man was gone. Gregor could see the shape, wrapped in the blue cloak that appeared dark as ink in the shadows. He closed the door behind him with his will, took a knee, and bowed his head. At the same time, he reached out with his consciousness towards the seated figure, concentrating on the blue stone clasped in a band around the neck. It was just a jewel to others, but he knew the moonstone to be a portal into his master's mind, who was distant, in a land that even Gregor did not know. Master, hear me. Your servant Gregor calls you. He repeated the plea in his mind a dozen times, before the lids of the revenant cracked open with a sound like paper folding. Slits of blue stared out at him from beneath the hood. Speak. The dead lips moved. My master, an insurrection is ongoing. A ship of slaves has broken loose, fifty or so. Well within your power to pacify, my student. Yes, but I thought the Revenant's appearance would intimidate them into a deeper submission. More than just a boy, King. Y yes my master He felt a ripple of displeasure. How he felt it he was not sure, as the Revenant did not betray any movement or affect. The face itself was stiff and dry, but somehow, in their communication, he could sense his master's moods, even catch flashes of where he was. Not that Gregor could ever piece the images together, the long shorelines, the tall city walls and even taller towers, the forest of masts clustered in a harbor. They looked like no place he had ever known. All he had ever known was Drowstrom, and, of course, that one memory of a sun-drenched hill, grass bending in the sea breeze, the receding shape of his family's hut, a blue sky, empty of clouds, and so he knew that there had to be more to the world than this rocky isle and its brooding fortress. But if he would ever see it, he knew not. If you are to convince them you are truly Gregor Twiceborn, he who conquered death and was reincarnated, you must act like it. His master spoke through the dry, husky voice of the corpse. Yes, master. Yet, yet I did not want to run the risk of failure. Felix, I fear, grows suspicious. We will deal with him in time, his master said, the corpse rising, its joints cracking as it moved towards the doorway, the smell of rot enveloping Gregor as it passed. For now, I shall see to the slaves. Felix should at least believe that the Revenant is obedient to you. He followed in the wake of the reanimated thing, its musculature coming to life, the stiffness in its joints lessening with each creaking step. Soon they swept into the halls of the keep, where novices in training knelt down when they passed. They always knelt down for Gregor Twiceborn. He was their lord and master, but now there was an extra frisson of fear at the sight of the revenant, its flowing blue cloak, those glowing eyes that were empty and full all at once. The warrior had been intimidating in life. In death, he was a horror. 
smoke was rising from the quay as Gregor and the Revenant made their way onto the lower walls of the castle that overlooked the shore. The soldiers who had gathered on the battlement parted for them. To all who witnessed, it appeared that the Revenant followed Gregor, at his whim, an illusion he and his master conspired to keep. The servor looked at him not as a child, but as a man reborn, who could control life and death. Gregor stopped along a balustrade and reached out for one of the soldier's spears. No sooner had he than the soldier surrendered his weapon. Gregor placed it in the hands of the revenant. With a fluttering of his robes, the warrior's corpse leapt down the height of the castle walls to the ground, landing next to the fire of wheelbarrows and barrels that the slaves had kindled at the doors of the gate. Gregor half expected his master to turn the flames against them, but that would have been a waste of their able bodies. His master knew how much they needed to repair the crumbling castle. Instead, he cast a binding spell on their legs, freezing those nearest him in place. He knocked them over with ease, using the blunt end of his spear. The slaves still on the ship gathered at the gangway, ready to do battle. Gregor could see a few trying to flee, leaping into the water to swim for the shore. They would be sorely disappointed to find that they were on an island, he thought to himself. Again he noticed the same young man lying as if dead on the deck of the slaver. His master boarded the slave ship without hesitation. Here he indulged himself, clashing with the arms of the rebels, meeting their strikes and thrusts, parrying their attacks and casting the men to the side, knocking them into the water or against the gunwale. He must have soon realized there was little challenge with this lot, and, as if growing impatient, he enchanted the weapons of the men, chains, stolen swords, maces, and axes, so that they grew red-hot. The men dropped them, smoking to the deck. Then, with a sweep of the revenant's arm, he sent them tumbling over one another, pushed by an invisible force, until they were crowded like goats in a pen at the stern of the ship. He bound their limbs as well, and they struggled, working against the paralysis, their faces betraying their fear and confusion. The dry, gravelly voice of the revenant spoke. Who is your leader? A good question, Gregor thought. They had to have one. The men betrayed him with their eyes, all looking to a man with a blonde beard and a defiant stare. He stumbled forward, the binding spell loosed unexpectedly. He was brave, for he stood tall, his shoulders thrown back, his chin high. What is your name? His master asked. Jekyll, he said, and I'll not surrender to no demon like you. Jacko took full advantage of his freedom and lunged for the Revenant, swinging a studded mace. The Revenant stepped aside, and in the same motion, he summoned a sword to his hand from one of the frozen slaves. Jacko redoubled his attack, but it was short-lived. The Revenant parried his next charge off to the side and caught Jacko by his long hair. The sword came down in a silver blur, and in an instant, the deck was sprayed in blood. Both Jacko's hands lay severed on the boards. Jacko dropped to the ground, his mouth agape a scream yet to emerge. He stared at his own bloody stumps, cowering as the revenant stepped closer, anticipating a more fatal blow. It did not come. It wouldn't, Gregor knew. Jacko would be spared, to be an example. The revenant spoke. The same fate waits for any other man who attempts insurrection. Work diligently, and you can earn your freedom. Now, who still dares to challenge the servoir and Gregor the Twice-Born? No man moved. The doors of the gate opened, and the servoir soldiers poured forth to restore order and dispose of the bodies of the dead slavers. His master's work done, Gregor moved the revenant towards the port side of the ship, where the corpse knelt down beside the prone young boy, lifted his head by the hair, looked into his face, then released him. The sound of his head hitting the deck 
echoing off the castle walls. Curious, Gregor thought. He turned to the sergeant on his right. Bring that slave to me, if he is still alive. 